Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, so many, many months ago, I got six Chilean cabs from my good friends at Creative Palette to review. This will be the fifth of six reviews about them. If you, want no, if you want to know more about Chilean wine in general, then please check out the first video in this series. And of course, this is a free sample provided to me. Neither Creative Palette nor the winery control how I review the wine or what I say. All right, and we're back over to the Maipo Valley or the Valle de Maipo. In actuality, the winery is in a different part of the region, Del Valle Central or the Central Valley, but the wine comes from the Maipo Valley. As a reminder, both the Maipo and Cochagua Valleys are in the Central Valley region with the Maipo to the north. The uh, Cachapoal Valley mostly separates the other two valleys. Let's get some history first. Like the last wine, the family who founded this winery, the Echeverria family, are from the Basque region of Spain. They came to Chile in the 1750s from the town of Amisqueta, now known as Amisqueta in, ba in Basque. The family settled north of Santiago and started farming the planted vineyards. Santiago is, a ch is the capital of Chile. 200 years later, in 1930, the other branch of the family arrives in Chile, this time from France, Roger Poffre de Vauban, a French engineer from Montpellier. He settles in the Curtico Valley in the town of Molina, which is 200 kilometers or around 125 miles south of Santiago. He also plants ungrafted vines from France that came from pre phylloxera vines. All right, the short version of phylloxera is that it was a root louse from the U.S. that devastated vineyards in Europe. By grafting European vines onto our American rootstock, phylloxera was effectively eliminated from the world's vineyards. Vines native to the U.S. are resistant to the louse. Now, Roger's daughter, Adriana, eventually marries Roberto Echeverria Rubio sometime in the 1930s, and they have a son named Roberto Echeverria in 1938. They established their own vineyard and winery in the 1950s, also in Molina. Roberto develops an interest in winemaking and gets a degree in agronomy and winemaking. He then gets a PhD in economics from Cornell in 1969. After that, he was an economist for the World Bank, which also led to travels and seeing wine from around the world. In 1979, he returned to Chile to continue the family business. Now, he thought things were good, but they were really in shambles. Not just the family business, but the wine industry in general in Chile. So he and his wife Gloria spent the next 15 years rebuilding and modernizing the family business while being pioneers within the Chilean wine industry. Now Roberto's son, also named Roberto, is the chief winemaker. They do hand harvesting in their estate vineyard. The text sheet indicated they do the same for the grapes for this wine, even though it's from the Maipo Valley rather than the vineyards on the winery's property in Molina. They follow sustainable practices such as using biodegradable products, recycling, and using solar on the property. They are also certified as a Certified Sustainable Wine of Chile. Yeah, that was a bit redundant, but that's how what they're, it's called Certified Sustainable Wine of Chile, so they're certified to be certified, right? Anyway, the link below to what all that means. The text sheet has the Chilean Sustainable logo on it. Now, here's the deal, though. The back label has none of this. I'm certain this is all true, but maybe not for the 2016 vintage. It appears that their commitment to sustainability started at the end of 2019 from a policy document on the website. They also show their current certification that's valid through January 2022 until January 2024. The tech sheet also says it's vegetarian and vegan. I'm not familiar with wineries saying they're vegetarian. Vegan, yes, as it almost always refers to no animal products used at all when it comes to fining the wine. That's the coarse filtration of a wine to get the larger solids out in a shorter amount of time rather than using strictly gravity or a centrifuge. Milk and egg whites are potential fining agents, so they wouldn't be vegan, but they would be vegetarian. Okay, I think I've covered all the important bits. Let's see the stats for the wine. The 2016 Echeverria Family Wines Limited Edition Cabernet Sauvignon 
suggested retail price about $25. All right, real quick, limited edition doesn't have any legal definition. They also call it special selection on the site. So I would say that this is probably a selection of barrels that Roberto felt were exceptional compared to the rest of the barrels in the same area. I'll also say that they only had information for the 14, 15, and 16 vintages of the wine, so they may no longer make it, or haven't had a vintage where they feel like they want to use that designation, or there's one coming, but they just haven't released it yet. In other words, it's maybe a somewhat rare bottle. I don't have production numbers, so take that last part with a grain of salt. Let's go back to the stats. It's from the Maipo Valley, the Entre Cordilleras climatic region. It's 85% Cabernet Sauvignon, 10% Syrah, 5% Carbonaire. It's hand harvested. It's hand sorted. Now, this is a very labor intensive way to pick out only the best grapes. This could also be part of the limited edition definition. They use stainless steel fermentation. It's aged for 12 months in 225 liter French oak. It's then blended, then aged an additional six months in oak. Now, this may also be an indication of a special selection. The ABV is 14%, the RS is 3.5 grams per liter, the pH is 3.6, and the total acidity or TA is 5.1 grams per liter. All right, let's get into the wine. A lot of 14 percenters in this group. All right, I'm super excited to try this one. It's another one of those, I didn't really know much about this winery at all. I think I'd seen the name before, but I don't remember ever having this. It's funny when I, I tell people I've never had that wine and I'll look at like pictures from like my past and like say I went to a conference or even just like, you know, a, a, a tasting group photo. I'll be like, oh, I had that wine like four years ago. <laughs> Who knew? All right. Oh, this us do color first. I mean, it's pretty much like all the other, all the other wines, like a medium concentration of Ruby. Um, Moderate, moderate mind staining on the glass. That, that's really, really surprising. I was expecting a lot more staining on the glass from all these wines. And, you know, moderate plus tearing. All right. We'll call it moderate aromatic intensity. It's youthful. Again, red fruits, black fruits. So raspberry, blackberry, kind of usual thing. You do smell a little bit of the alcohol, a little bit of that whiskey lactone. I mean, it's almost French barrel, but there's like this, but I can smell the alcohol. It's got a little bit of that Kirsch Royale type of thing going on, okay? Yeah, like almost like a Luxardo version of, of these fruits. But not as intense as last week's wine. A little bit of tobacco, just like regular tobacco, not sweet, not green, just regular tobacco. Kind of a, a bramble, kind of like a woodsy type of thing going on. It's kind of rustic smelling. Got some dirt, got some leaves, dried leaves, forest floor. Dry, dry in nature. We got some red hot in there, some cinnamon, a little bit of clove, a little bit of burn from the alcohol. All right, let's taste it. It's very much like the nose. You've got that cin cinnamon is kind of a prevailing thing with this one. It's almost like eating a red hot, but you combine it with some raspberry and some blackberry. Um, pretty ripe, but not like super like over the top ripe, not like sweet ripe, but like, you know, just, just ripe. Um, Yeah, a touch of herbaceousness, a touch of fresh earth, a touch of tobacco. Um, it's not so. It's not as impactful as the as last week's wine on the on the palate. It's a little more reserved. It's a little more like you got to come find me type of thing. There's nothing wrong with that. that just because it's a little reserved doesn't mean it's like not a good wine. It just isn't a showy, and I think that's a good way to put. The Los Vascos wine is a little bit showy. It, you kind of think about the Rothschilds, you know, as a family, but like with the, with, you know, their Bordeaux properties, expensive stuff. Well, they actually make a lot of a wide range of stuff, but they're known for their expensive stuff. Um, yeah. This is not as, as showy. It's, I wouldn't say call it more elegant. I just call it more reserved. It makes you want to get to know it better. How about that? As a result, it, I, it's, it's taking me more concentration to really pull out things. Um, I think this is a wine that if I let it breathe, like I actually decanted it or you know, opened the bottle, though opening the bottle does work, but it takes forever for really the wine to oxygenate. But 
And this is why I think if you let it sit in a decanter or just let it sit in the glass for a while, it's going to get more complicated. It's going to get more, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to blossom more like a flower, right? It's not delicate like a flower, but um, I think it will do that. So I get a little bit of that, again, that cinnamon red hot, uh, the, the raspberry, blackberry, riper in nature, a little bit of earth, um, a little bit of green, a little bit of herbaceousness, um, a touch of clove, not a lot of vanilla going on there. The alcohol, it doesn't, so the alcohol was more present on the nose. It was more noticeable. Um, I feel it, but it's actually of the 14 percenters I've had, the actual says 14%. Um, it's one of the lower versions of it. Like it's not as noticeable. This is a wine I probably could sit back and just sip on. I know it's, it's literally a hundred and I think it's a little hundred degrees outside right now. It's like what, five thirty, and it's like a hundred degrees. And where I'm facing is West. So the sun is about to start going into this part of the room. It's already kind of hot because there's actually no air conditioner vents where I'm at. Um, I mean, this is a dining room area, so this is not like an enclosed room, but my blue screen slash green screen definitely blocks a lot of airflow of anything that might be coming through from the air conditioner, which has been on like all day. I feel like it's opening up a little bit more. It's really smooth. It's, but there's a little bit of acidity to it, like a little bit of, a little bit of like, a little bit of tartness or a little bit of bite to it. I don't want to use the word bite. I don't know freshness to it, a little crispness to it, not let bite. Yeah, there's a little bit of like Christmas to it, crispness, crispness, not Christmas, not Christmas, crispiness, if you want to call it that. Um, freshness to it, right? It's it's like a fresh set of, of, uh, of, of uh, flowers and a little bit of floral to it. Um, not really potpourri dry, but more fresh. And the fruit is more fresh in nature. Everything's fresh, like the, 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 the earthiness, um, even like now it's getting to be more cinnamon rather than red hot. Um, I think the red hot was associated because though the alcohol is kind of combined with the cinnamon, now it's it's more in balance with each other. Even though I do notice the alcohol, it's not like making it more like a red hot candy. It's more like this cinnamon, maybe a cinnamon candy. Um, again, not sweet, but like spice driven on the cinnamon. Uh, a touch of vanilla. Yeah, a little bit of tobacco, not a ton of it. Um, and the herbaceous is really, it's really hiding the herbaceous. So this is really cool because most of the Chilean wines, really, the pyrazine isn't like over the top. In some ways, I'm a little bit bummed because I really like having that noticeable bell pepper or jalapeno or just like noticeable green. Most of the other wines, they're all over here on this side. Most of the other wines have it in some form or fashion. Most of it is like really subtle. This one is, I wouldn't call it non-existent, but I think it feels like the least amount of all the wines. With that said, it's there. Like if I was blind tasting this, I'd be like, man, this is probably, this is probably, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon based wine. And honestly, most of the wines, I, I could easily see myself calling this Bordeaux. This one I could call Bordeaux. The other ones I could call Bordeaux. But the one difference about this and Bordeaux, especially when we're talking higher in Bordeaux, is usually the oak is more prominent. Now, a $20 Bordeaux may be not as prominent. Like, you know, this is the $20 to $25 range. But yeah, it's a good wine. If you find it, you should buy it. Mm. This is a wine that needs to soften from the air and it really starts opening up. This, this should be decanted. I need to go decant a $25 bottle of wine. Yeah, you can decant any wine if you like. I think this wine should be decanted. All right, so that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and tell all your friends, and then we'll see you next time.